My name is Jason Belair. The photograph of, is of my amazingly wonderful, beautiful sister, Kirsten. She's um, uh, uh, a clinical counselor and she's the director of behavioral health. And she helped me do a lot of the initial research. So I want to give a shout out for her. Uh, the topic today is uh, rethink at yourself, and it's about emotional intelligence. Um, a little bit about me, uh, because as a designer, you're required to do that. So um, I'm, I split my time right now between Denver and Bozeman. Uh, I've traveled to many places around the world, and uh, if you are from any of these places and you have a free couch, let me know. I settled in Argentina for seven years, so I'm lived uh, internationally, which has been an uh, incredibly eye-opening experience for me being um, you know, an entitled white uh, American. A uh, little background in terms of my trajectory. Uh, back when I was a student in the early 90s, I was involved in IDSA, which is the Industrial Designers Society of America. Fast forward to today, I'm the chair of that organization, uh, which is actually a pretty big deal. Um, and I lose a lot of sleep as a result of it, so um, I do not take it lightly. You'll also see that uh, there's a structure, uh, blood moon uh, over the mountains there. Uh, I've been working with Michelle uh, for a number of years. Um, she's been gracious enough to allow me to be on the advisory board and to speak every once in a while and to help uh, develop content, so thank you for that. Really love it, appreciate it. Um, and so some of what we're talking about here is going to revolve around language, linguistics, and the understanding of why we ended up the way we were. Um, so when you think about like the word stress, you know, and all the different languages and whether or not it's a masculine or neutral or feminine uh, noun, whether or not it's, uh, you know, based on traditions, whether or not life experiences influence the way that we look at those words or interpret those words, whether or not there's trauma, current wars, you know, the pandemic, all of these things are creating in us uh, a real heightened sense of angst and, and uncertainty. Um, and also things that are in our faces now about, uh, and this has been hit on before uh, as well, which is, um, you know, uh, the contribution that we have as designers to what's going on in the world. And do we, are we immune to it? Are we actually, you know, contributing to it? Uh, how much responsibility should we place on ourselves? That weighs in, that, that creates stress. Um, and as Americans alone, you know, we represent 5% of the world's population, but generate 30% of the world's garbage, right? Um, Americans waste or cause to be wasted nearly 1 million pounds of materials per person every year. I want to bring this to our attention because as we are developing and becoming critical thinkers, it is important to understand that each of our touch points um, are in fact uh, contributing and, and we have power. We can do things about that. We can understand and have greater conversations, but in the right context. Um, there's also the idea, and um, uh, you know, Bob and I were just talking and Adrian about that book, uh, Designing for the Perverse from Arturo Escobar, he's Colombian, uh, how design has also created uh, a, a greater disparity between class. Um, it's also created um, urbanization and the pover impoverished you know, people are going to these areas and it's still becoming slum towns. And, and so design has an opportunity to reverse that, but also it is a contribution. <clears throat> and so we are growing further apart um, and uh, rather than closer together. We also can look at things historically, like back in the day in the 50s and the 40s, you know, doctors were smoking in their office and they were going, yeah, this is amazing, this is great. And, and then you look at where we are today, right? And the, where it's led us. And I would push back and, and, and really encourage us to think about things in terms of like the metaverse as well. Like, what does that look like? Right now, it's all great. Let's, let's hop on that bandwagon. Let's do all these things. But yet, what is it going to look like 10, 20 years from now? And are we really thinking about that critically? Right now, uh, we're about nine languages a year or one every 40 days cease to be spoken. Um, that should be alarming to us, right? That should be very um, sobering. Uh, by 2080, the rate will rise to you know, 16 languages by the middle of next uh, century we will be losing our linguistic heritage at a rate of 26 languages each year, one every two weeks. This is the kind of thing that has to be thought of as designers. Um, we have to be able to, to, to control and to uh, contribute in com greater conversations. Otherwise, this is just gonna continue to happen and we won't stop it. So, and this is brought up uh, as well. One in four workers relied on unemployment during this pandemic, right? So thank you, COVID. Thank you for the memories, right? Fucking bitch. Um, 
which, you know, makes sense. I mean, just look at what I just got through talking about, right? Those things are going in our subconscious if they're not in our conscious already. And they really do affect us. And they affect the way we live our lives. They affect us in ways, can we really have joy and happiness if we're not resolving those kinds of issues? So you're not alone. Um, this is me uh, when I was about four or five. But it's me during a very abusive, traumatic life of period in my life. And so for me, it's important to express that you're not alone. Uh, those of you who can identify with some of those hardships, uh, that affected and molded me into the way I think. And quite honestly, I've had to spend most of my life unlearning and, un and, and rethinking about these things as a result, which is good, but it's fucking hard. So, you know, one, we have to each individually invest in ourselves, which is really what this talk is about. 30% um, of people tested can accurately identify their emotions when they are happening. That's a pretty low number. That really does start to show that we maybe are not spending enough time on ourselves, understanding ourselves, and understanding why we do the things we do. Uh, maybe it's because we've been drinking the Kool-Aid for so long, and the bubble's so great that we don't necessarily even know and are in tune with these things, right? Um, this is a really awesome illustration from uh, Martha Rosler. Uh, this is, I mean, if you just look at it, it's like she's got this amazing, beautiful new uh, vacuum, probably state of the art at the time. She's cleaning her drapes. You open it up and the Vietnam War is going on. And, and there's, there's a level of absurdity, but truth within this image. And I think it still applies to a lot of what we do today and the way we think and perceive things. But there is hope. Um, and I think a lot of what I'm talking about is in, it's all in our head, right? Um, and it literally is in our head. It's really processing in the frontal cortex. And so it's a, more or less an opportunity for us to, um, uh, and that's actually glowing red, you see that? And then it flashes. Ah, that's because that's I'm a designer. Um, but you know, emotional intelligence is really what is gonna help us make sense of why why we do the things we do and why are we able or not able to look at things in the, the, through the optics and, and the way that we need to, uh, to create change. But just real quick, IQ and EQ, there is a difference, right? Um, essentially, the IQ is something that you're born with. You can't read a thousand books and, and increase your IQ, but you can work very hard on your emotional intelligence and grow your quotient on that and become more sensitive and, and you know, be able to do more and, and communicate more and be more sensitive to others. Um, so it can't, but it can't predict, IQ cannot predict um, emotional intelligence. Um, and you know, it's, emotional intelligence is what makes the behaviors of the creative distinct from your intellect. Now the capacity to be aware, to control, um, and express one's emotions and handle interpersonal relationships judiciously is empathetic. It's empathetically driven. And yet I often wonder where does empathy really come from, you know? Is it something that is uh, just a word that was identified by some Greek scholar, you know, 2,000 years ago, and we just keep using it today because it's the right thing to do? Or do we really fully understand it? And I think this is an opportunity to also dig deep into that. What's also very interesting is that the lowest scores on emotional intelligence tests are, stereotypically, but true, the CEOs, right? Which is very interesting because so often we are never invited to the table, the big table, the, the, you know, we're never really invited to those great conversations that need to be had because these guys are closest to the fiduciary um, stakeholders. And so it does sort of take a different mindset to be able to be in that position and to create and control, um, you know, uh, the, the, to have that great, enormous amount of responsibility. Um, but it's, it's about profit. It's not about many other issues or things. And that's the great thing about capitalism. Also, what's interesting is that the CEO often looks to different resources to get the kind of help that they need, that they think they need. Um, and they'll spend, you know, a million dollars or two million dollars with McKinsey, and McKinsey will come in and audit and give all this wonderful insight, and nothing really changes. Nothing really happens, right? So you also have to be careful, because even within this context, we idolize and we glorify so many amazing creatives out there, or people that have done wonderful things. And, but we forget that the emotional intelligence side of it is, is, has been missing, right? I mean, he was very much known to be a prick. 
Um, but he did what he did. He, he moved everything into the direction it was supposed to at Apple. And Steve is, you know, he'll always be known for that. But when you look at the leadership quality, there's a lot to be questioned. So how does this relate to the creative and to the processes that we need to adhere to? So EQ has more impact on us creatives than IQ does. It also accounts for 58% of our performance. That's kind of worth thinking about. So when I say invest in yourself, that can then translate into uh, better pay, um, greater advantages within your work, within your job. So you need, it, it is worthy if you're looking at you know, how to advance, it's not just about the importance of building a design brief, which is really crucial to that, but it's also investing in yourself in a very fundamental way. And as creatives, we have to read and understand the way that creatives do, right? And it is different. Um, I was having a great conversation with uh, Nate Young, who's the chief design officer for Newell Brands. And he was the first person that ever mentioned to me that, you know, designers are introverts. And for whatever reason, I never thought about that. I just, I, I mean, I just never thought about it in, in that context. And so... It's like, well, then that means that we need to really start having conversations based on where we're at, like meeting each other where we're at. But we're also very emotional. You know, we're emotionally driven. We care. We're passionate. We're sensitive, right? That's a superpower. Um, and yet, oftentimes, it's not really regarded or put in, you know, to, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's not really um, glorified or, or, you know, advanced as well as it should be. So, Remember that, you know, also for designers, we are unfortunately not um, a top-down kind of approach. We don't have that power. I think right now the statistics are there's like around 25 chief design officers in the entire world. Um, so I think there's room for more growth, you know, and of course DEI specifically. You know, there's lots of opportunity. But we are about the bottom-up approach. We're, we're scrappy, we're, um, you know, we're kind of grungy, we're able to make shift and, and prototype and, and you know, get down and dirty and make things happen, which is an advantage, right? Um, and this is why we have to also look at it and say, well, what is this, you know, are we questioning and digging deep into the things that we need to, to really make sure that we are um, doing what we can, doing our best uh, to ensure that the processes that we're utilizing are always being questioned. Um, is there opportunity for change and growth in that? And specifically the comfort zone. Um, we, I would venture to say that the cell phone is one or two within the greatest addictions that we have um, here in the United States specifically. But I think we also, right up there is complacency. We don't, want to be, we don't want to be bothered. We don't want to be pushed. We, don't, we just want to live our life. I mean, you know, everything's hard, everything, and I get it, right? But it's also building bubbles and it's building systems that are not allowing us to dig deep into the way we do. So we need to always be looking at ways to get out of that comfort zone. So this is our chance as creatives. This is, you know, we can, we can do this, we can look at this. So this is kind of a little exercise that I like to, to do. It's called the growth zone. And it's a way of looking at how the systems are, to a certain degree, are created. So like if you look at this, you can see that there's in the center a safe zone, a grown zone, and a growth zone. Um, these are important because it's, you always start off with the safe zone. So this little exercise mentally is when you think about attributes of what safe is, you know, oftentimes we'll think of warmth, we'll think of peace, right? And then the question mark, you can put in whatever you think is, is appropriate for that. So you can literally do this um, on your own uh, when you are going through a certain process or a transition in your life, right? Something transformative. Um, so you're, you're really identifying what's in that safe zone. And then you kind of think about, well, what is the, almost the antithesis of that? What's the, outs, the outer side of that? Which is, you know, kind of opposite would be cold or hostile. And again, put your name in there, right? Uh, your, your descriptor. And when you get to the growth zone, then it's like, well, what was the outcome as a result of you going through that exercise? What did you learn? And you then start to become empowered. You realize that you're capable. You know, you have opportunities to do things that you weren't able to do, all because you invested in yourself and because you invested in the opportunity to grow, you know, your, your own emotional intelligence. And so if you kind of look at it from, um, you know, from an overall perspective, you've got basically four you know, visuals here that I created. One is uh, showing the safe zone going out into the grown zone. 
And then you can see the grown zone kind of going back in, merging into the safe zone, and that's number two image. And then you see that that safe zone has now grown bigger because you went through that exercise and you gave yourself the opportunity to be uncomfortable and to question your complacency and, and the areas that you need to improve by. And then it just keeps expanding. And so that safe zone that was originally this small is now this big and then becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. And that contributes to the 58% of EQ contributing to your overall you know, process and progress. <clears throat> So as I mentioned before, um, this cell phone uh, technology is, we've yet to fully discover the, not only the positive, right, but the negative of what these, this addiction that we have will have in the future. But we do know that as of now, as an average, every time that you work um, and you have your cell phone and you're deep in your research and it pings and Rio texts me, like he always does, um, and I look at it and I pick it up. He's sitting right there, so you can yell at him later. Um, he, uh, you know, the idea is like when that happens, you, it takes like 23 seconds to get back into that sense of, of focus, right? How many have you seen your coworkers like always on their phone, right? As an entrepreneur, if I'm paying somebody money to do work and they're always on their phone, I'm not really making money. It's not a very good business sense. So again, want to try to, do, to recognize, be critical, and, and regain focus as often as we can. But we also need to ask questions like, what other distractions exist um, in our lives, right? Well, these are actually quintessential things that, um, that are true. Uh, there's an amazing book uh, called Everybody Lies, The Truth About uh, Big Data and, and What the Internet Can Tell Us About Ourselves. Adrian, did you just did you just mimic that first one? Yeah, you did. Okay, Santa. Um, so anyway, uh, but the idea is like what we're learning is that, and the research that he did uh, based on Google Analytics is that basically the United States, to a certain degree, is 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 um, addicted to pornography. And, um, and so that takes on different ways, different roles, uh, different outlooks, but it's, it's becoming a, fa a known fact. So we're also like looking at religion and food and drugs as ways to offset and, and numb ourselves from having to look at ourselves critically and to dig deep. And so how many of you are like even thinking about looking at your phone? Is it itching? Christian, come on. You're like, I want to I text somebody. No. Um, so when we don't take time to dig deep and understand, there's, you know, our chances of not listening and engaging in appropriate ways goes up. Imagine doing research um, and you are in a place where you're not really fully focused. You're not even understanding why you do the things you do. You don't understand that the trauma that you incurred when you were a child somehow affects your ability to do proper research today. If you're not digging deep and thinking about those things, then you're not as effective as you could possibly be. And imagine what life would be like on the other side of that if you did invest and you did try to learn that. But we have to unlearn, which is hard. We're an additive culture. We are always adding, adding, adding. We're adding cell phone um, addiction and all these technology. Things. I, I'm the first to admit I've got a great portfolio of investments and half of them are in the tech world, which are probably preying on children. Let's be honest and I'm making money off of it. It sounds shitty, but if you're really being honest about it, it's kind of the reality of the situation. I'm not willing to necessarily stop that behavior, but I'm willing to add on and continue to, to talk about the metaverse and to see, you know, let's just keep going forward and, and not really resolve the problems that we have today. That was a little bit of a dig, but it was just trying to be questioning here. Um, <laughs> But it really can be traced back even to our educational systems that have failed us from the very beginning. You know, one plus one is two, two plus two is, it's never been one plus one is two, but really, could it be two something, two eight, two point zero, two? Could we have the opportunity to question that? So for change to occur, we have to look at ourselves always, constantly, not in a way that's depressing, which I'm probably sounding like to a certain degree, but it's just the reality. We're not spending enough time doing that. And I'm not gonna go deep into this, but I want you to please think about these things because this is about a conversation about a conversation. This is about your opportunity to dig and to figure out what 
you need to do in the way that you need to do it um, to best suit your needs, but to also understand how your self-awareness is, the self, like what kind of self-regulation do you have? Um, what are the motivating uh, factors and empathies and you know, how does it affect social skills? So those are things you have to do. Now, I'm gonna play a game here. I'm gonna throw some images out here. And I just want you to kind of be in yourself, in your body, sitting in your chair and be aware of what is happening as I show you these images, okay? So we're going through this quickly, obviously. The reason for that is because for some of you, you most likely, you know, it's a little bit jovial, it's a little bit absurd. Um, but for some of you, you might have known someone who has paying way too much money for pharmaceutical products. And so you look at that image um, of whatever his name is, um, Mr. Asshole, extreme, um, and you get to see how, um, you, know, you get to react and feel something different, but yet for someone else in the audience, they look at that same image and it doesn't have the same thing. So where were you in that, in that space at that time? Were you feeling compassion? Were you feeling judgment, right? We have to continue to check ourselves. And not being able to manage our emotions means in the heat of a situation we, meet out, we, we miss out. That's been really hard for me. I'm a 1980s punk rocker. I mean, I literally would go and get in fights with Air Force cadets um, and, you know, skinheads, like Nazi skinheads. I have scars on my body. I mean, literally. And why? Because of the trauma that I experienced as a child taught me that, you know, physical violence is okay. It, it accomplishes what I need to do to, to whatever that means, right? I'm no longer that way for the record. Please understand that. I feel like I've totally changed. But... But the, the initial like mm, angst, anger, right? And now I'm learning that if I can control that and understand that, all these opportunities come that di didn't exist before. So there's only one thing that we can do at this point, really, when you're reflecting on all this. And I think you all agree. It's just important that we start consuming more marijuana. I mean, <laughs> right? So, um, or your drug of choice, I suppose. But uh, that's, a, that's a really, that's a joke. Um, but so as we strive towards self and social awareness, um, we see change, we can start to see empathy build. Again, I don't necessarily know where empathy totally comes from. I know what people will tell me they think it comes from, but I don't really know. Um, I guess do my own research is something I haven't really done well enough, but, um, but it's, it's just a fact, right? So, but we know that empathy does exist, and whatever you want to call it, is something that's going to inevitably help us. Um, and without it, you know, without the ability, without empathy, right? So without the ability to understand others, you can't conduct research properly. This is so important. Again, going back to um, certain readings and, and, and uh, research, which is, is indicating that we as people are not doing the proper research. We're doing the same thing that we were taught to do. But people are changing. People are responding differently. People and their biases are no longer really sharing what the truth of the matter is. They're just, and they're going to the table already wanting to please you. And that is identify, that, that's just a natural reaction. So when we're conducting research, if we understand that, then the empathy does become an opportunity to pull things out or to guide a conversation in ways that haven't been done before. And so herein lies another opportunity to succeed. So, Creative outlets become a form of uh, necessary expression, a place to take a risk. You know, now that you're starting to gain um, your, your confidence and gain certain things, um, you know, within your work acumen, you do all of a sudden have this ability to take greater risks. Um, and so you critically ask yourself, you know, again, and this ties in with uh, the, the, the design brief, you know, and your brief, it's like asking yourself about your job literally critically thinking about it. Bob did a great job last night about expressing how it was for him during the Nike days and you know, what he was trying to transition into and not knowing things, right? Um, understanding and digging deep into what are, what are you doing? Not just what is your job, because that's not who you are, but it's also the ontological aspect of things. Who are you as a person? How did you wound up being the way you were? And what do you really want to be doing? These are just things that are ongoing conversations that you need to have. Um, I love the fact that there's a theme going on, which is 
life fucking sucks in a way and, and it's hard and we need to be there for each other, but we also need to understand that our mental health is imperative and we deserve to have these hard conversations and to grow um, the conversation even if it doesn't feel right, you know? Um, so anyway, but going back to my point is like, you know that there's something better out there. There's something deep inside of you that's pulling you into something that you don't really know just yet. You're in your studio, you know, and, and Christian is asking himself, oh, sorry, I want to keep using it as an excuse. Um, but, you know, you start asking yourself, like, why aren't we doing better? Like, what is happening within this culture and this dynamic? And what are, where are the opportunities for change? Why is it so easy to come up with excuses? And I think that's a huge thing as, as being addicted to complacency. Um, there's, there's room for excuses, um, which I think then becomes a conversation about integrity. That's not for now. So um, what I even know what it looks like to be in a culture of creativity, of innovation. This is a really important question that I ask myself because I have uh, equity and, and investments. So I put my money where my mouth is. And so um, there's this new venture that I'm in and it's, you know, there, there's opportunity for me to teach them things that they don't know or have ever thought of. Um, and when they talk about innovation, they're talking about iter iteration. And when I talk about innovation, I'm talking about things that have never been done before. And that's what I want to put my money in, right? But is my definition as a result of all this work that I've done on myself? Or am I just perpetuating something, this, con this conversation that's cyclical, that I, this way of thinking, this indoctrination, you know? I think, I think it's maybe both. You know, you think about our work and our school, um, the cultures and the environments, and the way that the psychological aspects are with us and towards us, right? We go through these systems and we don't even understand, like, you had, a, you had a choice to stop and think about this and really under, critically wonder whether or not this is the right thing for me, right? But it does affect us. And in certain contexts, and this is kind of like one of the things you can put, um, you know, scroll up or scroll down, uh, you know, you can start to ask yourself, how do you feel in a certain context, you know? Are you afraid? Are you anxious? Are you depressed? Being self-aware is imperative to your success and to growing that 58%, um, you know, for, for uh, emotional intelligence. You can also look at it and say, in order to be better, you know, uh, me and processes, I will what? I'm going to control self-talk, which is what Bob actually mentioned yesterday too. Um, or I'm going to smile and laugh. I have literally spent the last three weeks um, with gratitude, really digging deep and saying every morning, I'm going to wake up and watch the sun, sunrise. And I'm going to be thankful and I'm going to call out those things that I'm thankful for. Never did that before. I don't know why. Um, when, you know, when you are or they are responding and you're feeling triggered, right? Right now, I might have said a few things that people are like, what the fuck? like who is this guy? You should get off the stage. Um, that sense of triggering is, is a great opportunity for you to dig deep and figure out why you felt that way. What is the truth of the matter? Is it really the words that I chose to use to represent a context or you know, something or what? One of the things that I love too about this situation and Surya Vanka, who is like the VP of global design uh, for Microsoft is a friend of mine. He, he uh, once told me, you know, Jason, um, it's, it's like you need to be a scientist. You need to be able to take the time to be a scientist and hypothesize and, and figure out like, well, wait a minute. Um, as a scientist, I don't have to be emotionally connected to this situation. I can actually be out here and not be so in here about this. And so now I get to play the game of saying, well, I'm gonna hypothesize. I'm gonna move forward in thinking about this in a new way, in a new, in a new outlook. And the great thing is, is the body doesn't lie. Um, you know, at lunch we were talking about how sometimes we get overwhelmed and we're tired, we're exhausted. Well, exhaustion also is a sign of shutting down. And your body is literally doing that. So if somebody, if you're in a meeting, by the way, I think, and I'm going to get these numbers wrong, but currently I believe, um, forgive me, I think this is like right when COVID was hitting. The idea was that um, there's like, 350 million meetings uh, every day, let's say, around the world. And technically, out of all of those, like the majority of them are useless. They don't accomplish anything. It's a complete waste of time. It's about somebody wanting to promote their agenda. 
how do you feel in that situation? What is your body telling you to, to, to look at and to think about? Um, so it's, and it is kind of a threat and response. So we want to make sure that here's some good books that I would love for you to continue uh, to, to look at and to think about. The Death of Expertise by Tom Nichols was really fantastic as well. Um, there's some, uh, Malcolm Gladwell's amazing, great podcast over there. Just, you know, again, continue to invest in yourself. Continue to take the time to grow um, and to, to grow out, you know, of your safety into that grown zone, allow that to, to, to live in that space. I mean, we had that talk to uh, Karun and I about, you know, giving ourselves the space to be uncomfortable and, and saying that that's okay. And that's something really imperative as we're coming out of COVID. So I want to thank you for your time. Uh, according to this, it still shows that I have 30 minutes. So that is not my fault, <laughs> but I am willing to entertain any questions that you guys have. If there, oh wait, now it says three minutes. <laughs> yes, uh, to the gentleman in the front. Here. Stand up. Okay. Here we go. Um, one of the things I, it's, it's funny. I feel like I, I listening to my speech yesterday and what's going on. I feel like these are all different iterations of looking at the same side of the can which is I'm really, really encouraged by, because I feel like this is like a, a conversation that is so long overdue. Um, and I, I think one of the things that really stuck with me, one of your discoveries, and one of the things I definitely um, discovered during my personal apocalypse, was the, like when you talk about just sitting with your emotions and noticing them, and not judging them. And there's that great scene in, uh, in Ted Lasso where he talks about um, curiosity versus judgment, mm. and staying out of judgment as long as you can. Um, which you, um, and you're, you're not, and even the words we use to describe these things, like it's not better, it is possibly more effective. But staying away from those words that assign value to emotions or experiences or things like that, I think it's just such a important, for me personally, such an important takeaway from all of this, is just to stay the fuck out of judgment as long as you possibly can. So. Yeah. I see a t-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> totally. That's, no, it's an observation. Oh, oh. <laughs> Well, I think, Bob, you're questioning whether or not what you thought yesterday that you were presenting was relevant or not is now being confirmed that it has tons of relevance. And that's a good thing. Yeah. And it's a good thing. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe. No. I feel good right now. No, 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 no. <laughs> Judgment, I feel great. It's right almost now. like when you react out of anger, you can be angry, yeah. but if you act out of anger, that's right. different. If right. you ask the question out of curiosity because right. you genuinely want to know something, yeah. then, then you're asking, and then, you grow, then it's like, then what you're doing is you're saying, I want to invite this to a greater conversation, right. and so I have to ask the question, and then if it doesn't make sense or is relevant, I'll just back down. I don't care. You know? That's it? That's all you guys have? Christian, I picked on you twice. I expect something more. He, he, he did well, say the coffee is really good over there, which I appreciate. It is really good. I do have a question, oh. then, if nobody else does. I would like to know um, kind of why slash how you got into studying emotional intelligence around oh, creativity that's a, and that's design. That's a really great question that any of you could have asked. God damn it. <laughs> but I'm going to shame you. And I'm going to do the opposite of what I just got through talking about. So, Dill, uh, great question. The, the answer to the question is, um, so I, uh, being that, that first slide, second slide that showed kind of my, um, you know, my trajectory of, of all this stuff, I've had the opportunity to really look and dig deep and ask questions with people that are way smarter than me, and most of you are in the room are. Um, it's like through those questions that I've asked, I have learned that over time, there are things that were missing. Me, uh, I was invited by Kenji uh, Hortonian, who was the, at the time the CEO of uh, um, uh, Outdoor Retailer, and this is like 11 years ago, and he asked me to, uh, be, to, to create the Trend and Design Center there. And so um, as I built that and as I was bringing people in to talk, I started to look and learn and realize that we're actually missing out on some really hard conversations. And so through that experience, I started to bring more people in that were talking about 
deeper and heavier things. And then as a result of that, having a resource that, you know, my sister, uh, who's a brilliant, um, you know, counselor, and she actually, trans she helps uh, veterans transition from the, the military to real, you know, to normal life. Um, so it's a huge thing that she's doing. Um, you know, it's like, we started to really have these conversations around, well, what is at the core of all this? We are at the core of all this. You know, our, our ability to change ourselves is the only thing that we can change. And yet we have all these excuses and distractions to not do that. So then I put on this, this talk, I did it at um, uh, Denver Startup Week uh, in 2019 originally. I thought I was gonna get 150 people. I had 950 people RSVP because they need, we need this. We need to be doing this and having these really hard conversations. Then um, I was invited to Taiwan to give the talk. I've given it to MIT um, and some other universities. And so I just, you know, I, I adapted a little bit, but I'm still trying to um, share because I still think that like sustainability, it's, it's, we need to talk about it till there's no reason not to talk about it, right? And we're only gonna, if we don't invest in ourselves. Oh God, Karun is, this is gonna be hard. I know it, I feel uh, it. Get ready. Um, okay, so my question is, if, if you take a powerful emotion like rage, mm -hmm. have you ever had the experience of translating that through a creative process or actually like engaging with your creative mind in a way to transform that to something else? Um, for those of you who are on the street homeless and you couldn't hear this, no. Uh, Honestly, I have not intentionally done that. I've done that in, a, in other ways, in other contexts, and any put in rage, put in whatever, um, you start to learn that it is, it is in, um, inhibiting those around you from, from reaching their fullest potential. Why would I do that? Why would I stop you from reaching, you know, I love you. I care for you. I want the, what's best for you. Why would I do that, right? Well, you're supposed to answer that. So to me, that's the thing is like, if like I've come into this space where now that's more important than the rage. Um, and so, but it's been through all that extra work that I put in. So I can't say that I had this like experience where I put this whiteboarding and I invited, you know, 20 psychologists and we worked on my rage. It was literally um, this sort of like, it's not worth it anymore, you know? It's counterproductive, it's inefficient. You know, and it doesn't really show that I love and I care and that I want what's best for you, right? And hopefully, in turn, you'll reciprocate that and then we all float, right?